Next presenter today is going to be William, who is talking about the once and future king of battle, artillery. So William Prom graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy with a Bachelor of Science in History and then commissioned into the United States Marine Corps. In the Marine Corps, he was an artillery officer who deployed to the Helmand province in Afghanistan in 2012 as a high Mars fire direction officer, and then again as a fire support officer and fire support coordinator. He is a kindred of spirit of mine because after leaving the Marine Corps in 2014, he attempted to make a career as a professional writer, uh, runner and is now a writer. So man after my own heart. Um, William, go ahead. I want to hear about you and some artillery. Let's do this. All right, thank you. Recent modifications to the Marine Corps force structure mark a significant change and unprecedented prominence for artillery, especially in relation to naval operations. As much of the Marine Corps prepares to shrink, segments of Marine Corps artillery are actually growing to align with expeditionary advanced base operations planning. This rise in the Marine Corps artillery is in stark contrast to how artillery is depicted, if it is at all, in many science fiction combat scenes. A survey of key franchises will reveal lessons and warnings for artillery's future. But first, a quick description of indirect fire, or IDF. It is the delivering of a projectile along a curved ballistic trajectory to a target beyond or outside the line of sight of a firing point. IDF generally provides greater range, variety of warheads and fuse types, and the ability to reach targets indefinitely. The most common forms of IDF uh, in modern times that the Marine Corps uses are mortars, artillery, and rocket artillery. First, Star Wars films and television shows feature a variety of military assets, but very few resemble what we understand as artillery today. Instead, most of the weapon systems called artillery are actually directed energy weapons, such as the Grand Army of the Republic's self-propelled heavy artillery turbo laser and the AV-7 anti-vehicle artillery cannon used during the Clone Wars. You can also see some in the Rebel Alliance's Defense of Hawk. However, the GAR's all-terrain tactical enforcer and all-terrain attack pod can elevate their mass driver cannons for indirect fire, but are typically shown operating as direct fire. In the few examples employing IDF, it's at a short range against targets in the Gun Lines field of vision. It's a very similar story for the Separatist Army's armored assault tank, although it can mount a cannon to fire the defoliator round. And mortars do appear very much like our own uh, during the Clone Wars at the Battle of Umbara. And the most recent season of The Mandalorian introduced the artillery trooper, uh, ideally or ironically on Friday, December 4th, the feast day of St. Barbara, patron saint of artillery. The employment may not be ideal, but he does achieve some suppression with a single tube, and that's a win for him. Honorable mentions include the Gungan catapult and Ewok catapults. So what do we see in Star Wars? Mortar systems similar to our own, few large firing pieces on a curved trajectory, and when they do, it's at a small, it's at, within uh, the gun line's field of vision. And instead, most traditional artillery has been replaced with directed energy weapons. We'll discuss explanations for that as we progress through the other franchises. Considering that Star Trek typically focuses on exploration, and when combat does occur, it's usually an interstellar battle, the lack of IDF is fairly reasonable. Ironically, for how little IDF features in Star Trek, there are some excellent depictions of how the stress of a bombardment uh, occurs on a TV budget. The only on-screen appearance of IDF assets is back in the first season of the original series. The episode is best known for Captain Kirk's fight with the Gorn Captain. But before that fight, a landing party from the Enterprise is suppressed by mortar fire from an unknown enemy on Cestus III. Kirk eliminates the threat with a single shot from a mortar-type grenade launcher. And in Deep Space Nine, Klingon artillery forces colonists on Echelon Prime to shelter in their bunker system in a season five episode. The artillery shelling that Jake Sisko experiences significantly impacts his uh, development through the story. So in Star Trek, we only see a single mortar system, but we do know that IDF assets exist and that they have the ability to suppress or destroy targets indefinitely. 
in other words, what you want artillery to do. Heinlein's Starship Troopers offers a more intimate look at the infantry soldier of the future. It's also a very different take on the combined arms approach that we use today. Instead of a variety of military assets and capabilities, Heinlein introduces one of the earliest examples of the power suit super soldier that is now common in films, TV, comic books, and video games. The mobile infantry soldiers he depicts are equipped with a variety of weapons, including tactical oxygen nukes, but no artillery or mortars appear in the book. The way the soldiers are equipped, armored, and employed, each individual soldier is really more like a platoon or company of modern infantry. They are, in effect, providing the support that artillery would for infantry today through mutual support of each other. The final franchise to review is the Alien Universe, more specifically, the United States Colonial Marine Corps, featured in Aliens. Set in 2179, this story is the closest to us chronologically, and the military element featured bears the closest resemblance to our own. 2nd Battalion Bravo Team is a standard platoon supported by a troop transport ship, two drop ships, and armored personnel carriers. However, we see no examples of IDF in the arsenal. But we, should we expect to? Most of the combat occurs in the interior of an industrial complex where the range is unnecessary and the curved trajectory is unfeasible. Also, with sub light speed travel and cryo sleep, the Marines' mission was going to be multiple years. A modern battery, artillery battery, will attach to an infantry battalion as part of a battalion landing team to deploy on a MU, but that arrangement usually only lasts about a year. And a single platoon probably wouldn't rate much beyond a section of mortars anyway. If operations require attaching sections to units for years at a time, then maybe a conversation on force structure reorganization is in order. Fortunately, the Colonial Marines Technical Manual, produced as a supplement to the movie, provides more about the Colonial Marine Corps' force structure beyond what we see of 2nd Battalion Bravo Team. The manual shows that the armored personnel carrier can equip a mortar system and that several self-propelled artillery systems akin to the modern U.S. Army's Paladin and MLRS do exist. It also addresses the limited availability of these assets because of the considerable heavy lift requirements for themselves and their ammunition. And that, I believe, is the key observation of IDF in the alien universe. Limitations of stowage space and lift capabilities. Our current terrestrial artillery requires significant embarkation space and logistics support to store, handle, and resupply ammunition for a mute. With a lack of ready resupply capabilities, those considerations grow exponentially with interstellar travel of an unsupported unit. This may explain the lack of artillery in other franchises as well. Artillery is great at sending lots of munitions downrange fast and accurately, but responsive fires also expend ammunition quickly. As an example, in 2012, while in Afghanistan, my platoon was firing missions nightly when we had identified a deficiency with a particular lot of Gimler's rockets. It eliminated a substantial portion of our available ammunition. The emergency resupply was no simple task here on Earth. I can only imagine what Gunnery Sergeant Alpone would have to go through for an interstellar mission. This is likely why we only see small mortar systems and uh, with a smaller embarkation footprint and large directed energy weapons. While directed energy weapons have significant lift requirements, they don't have additional ammunition or additional calculations to change uh, for the change in gravity, atmosphere, or curvature of the planet as other IDF assets will. A discussion of trade-offs could last all night, so I will limit it to just a few more points. Directed energy weapons are powerful, but are limited to line of sight targets. Likewise, rocket artillery can drop a lot of HE accurately on targets and defilade but are also expensive. And frankly, sometimes problems only need a 155 or 81 millimeter solution. Perhaps more distressing than artillery's common absence in science fiction is its rudimentary use when it does appear. The complexity of fire missions depicted peaks at creeping barrages akin to those in World War I, but on a much smaller scale. And the guns in World War I at least hit targets beyond the gun line's view. It may be heretical to say at NavyCon, but some of these science fiction writers lack imagination, at least when it comes to coordinating fires and combined arms operations. 
But before you accuse me of toxic fandom, yes, I know these universes and the combat in them weren't created to simply please the artillery communities of the Army and the Marine Corps. The artillery community, however, should take the lack of IDF assets in science fiction and its rudimentary use as a warning of what could happen if others don't understand the need for artillery or it doesn't innovate to stay relevant. Adopting new technologies and developing new capabilities for older systems will be key to avoiding this fate. The evolution of HIMARS within the Marine Corps may be an example to follow. The U.S. Army adopt, operated the system since 1998, but when the Marine Corps adopted it in 2008, many in the artillery community were hesitant of its use. Thankfully, others experimented, refined operations, identified new capabilities, and found more opportunities to employ the system. These innovations led to HIMARS firing from the deck of U.S. amphibs, firing missions using sensors from Navy ships, and conducting HIMARS rapid infiltration packages. These capabilities and more have made artillery a key component to expeditionary advanced base operations, which are designed to support the next generation of naval operations. So what will the future of artillery be? For at least the near future, it appears to be rocket artillery. The Marine Corps Force Design 2030 will reduce 21 active duty howitzer batteries down to five, while increasing HIMARS launchers by 300%. The HIMARS launcher is a versatile system, but it comes with a significant ammunition resupply requirement. But that is the price of a GPS guided munition with a longer range and a larger warhead compared to cannon artillery. So with those trade-offs, does that make directed energy weapons the artillery of the distant future? Perhaps, there still will be that issue of only line of sight targets. But maybe, so we'll need to find something to get those targets in defilade. If we don't come up with something, we may just have to return to the Gungan catapult. Thank you for your time. I look forward to your questions. All right, thank you so much. That was awesome. And uh, I appreciated all the different aspects that you brought in and the different examples that uh, I think really helped make your case.